episode number two. Two of two. Glad you guys are uh, back fireside with me. Cozy on up. Grab a blanket. Grab a pillow. Let's get chatting. So I'll tell you, I'm uh, I'm excited to be back. This was uh, last week's episode. Episode number one was a fun thing for me. It was it was one of those things. About hour one, I was I was like, oh man, the time's already up. So I'm I'm glad that uh, anyone that's listened to episode one, hope that you enjoyed it too. We're gonna be coasting into our uh, our theme a little closer in this episode today. Today we have our first guest. Guest is gonna be Mimi Page. She is a singer, songwriter, composer. Happens to be my lovely wife as well. So you know, I didn't have to reach very far to get uh, a very talented first guest. But uh, it was a great it was a great talk. I think you guys are gonna enjoy it. We covered covered. Lots of different topics, including uh, her collaborations, her solo albums, her composing, and what it's like to be an entrepreneur, uh, what it takes to fight through both success and failures, successes and failures. So it was a good talk. I'm glad that we did it, and uh should be fun. Like I said, I'm, I'm, I'm glad to be back, glad to uh, be in your ears again, in your head. And, um, you know, I'm chugging along this week, always pursuing the dream. One of, uh, one of Mimi's friends or colleagues had mentioned in listening to the podcast, made a great, uh, little observation or, you know, kind of a request and said, she said that she really enjoyed podcasts and other stories and other things that you, that you keep up with weekly. She enjoyed having little, uh, benchmarks and, you know, things that I'm doing that, that I'll update you on. So I thought that that was some good advice. I'm going to, I'm going to try to do that as much as possible. But, you know, I had mentioned in week one that I am pursuing my real estate license at the, at the moment that I am running a business. We run a brick and mortar called the Dreaming Peddler. And of course we're broadcasting from the back of the Dreaming Peddler, which is the uh, Dreaming Peddler Studios now. It's really just my desk. So at some point we'll also get some, get some visuals here. We'll, uh, maybe do some live, uh, live footage, but I'll be updating you guys on, on, you know, what it's like to be running a business and what it's like with the real estate side, which is a completely new venture for me. What it's like, you know, doing the podcast, et cetera. But on the real estate side, I am about 75% of the way through the schooling portion. I am blazing through it. Uh, I think I started it three or four weeks ago, and I am I am seventy five percent of the way through, I'm trying to absorb a lot of information. I'm not a huge fan of the the platform that I chose, and I'm not gonna I'm not gonna call them out a name, but I'm really not a fan of it. Feels like they they just they they threw up a, a real estate dictionary into a, a web page and, and handed it over to me and said, you know, here learn this. And so. You know, I'm I'm doing my best with it. I like that it's self managed though, because um, I I always do better when I'm kind of managing myself. Um, but I'm making it through. There's there's six total for anyone that doesn't know or maybe you're interested. There's six total sections you got to go through, and you have thirty uh, hours, kind of class hours in each one of them. So in Texas, it's it's 180 hours, and from what I've read. Uh, the Texas real estate exam process is one of the hardest in the country with with the, the easiest, according to some of the statistics, statistics that I saw, was Hawaii. In the Hawaii, it's fairly easy to get it. And then there's a lot of people that have it but just don't practice. But Texas is one of the most difficult, according to the data I, I was looking at. And I, I believe it. it. You know, I thought that it was going to be a bit easier um, than than it than it it's turning out to be, but I'm doing just fine. Um, I've made it through. I am on the fifth section out of six, and I'm about eighty percent through that section. So I mean, by my calculation, I should be done within seven days. Definitely, I'm gonna knock out as much as I can tonight. For for all the parents out there and all the other uh, business owners. Um, 
I, I get I get my my personal work done uh, between 11 p.m. and 3 a.m. That, that's my time. So I put on headphones and put on some music, and while uh, while the wifey and the baby sleep, I am learning the real estate stuff. What am I listening to right now? I am listening to Dead Mouse. I'm I'm kicking back to to old days and listening to Dead Mouse. It's I, I like that it's uh, you know it's progressive, obviously, and and it, it it's got good melody to it, but there's no lyrics. There's nothing that distracts me. So I'm listening to some Dead Mouse, and then when I when I want to hear something, my ba- my band right now is uh, uh, War War on Drugs. Fantastic music. So I'm I'm almost uh, almost through the the uh, fifth section working on the sixth after you finish those sections then you go and you take a uh, an in-person exam and I think it's you know like 60 questions state uh, relating to you know specifically your state and then like an 80 question federal I might have that backwards I might have the numbers wrong but you take a you take a que- you know you take a test it's around 150 questions you do it in person and if you pass that, then you have an inactive license, and then you take that license and you bring it to one of the brokers that you want to work with uh, that's that's in your area. And, um, you know, you sit down and see if you're right for them, if they're right for you, and then you hang your license at that broker, and then you can practice. So I'm looking forward to doing that. Like I said, should be done in the next seven days, and so I estimate that I'll be... Um, talking to the brokers that I've really been looking at that I that I admire uh you know from a distance on social media around here I think that they're all uh cool people and they put themselves out there so I'll I'll update you guys as I go and let you know how that goes when I sit down and talk to them uh the store my store you know we sell crystals and we sell uh Crystal related items, talking about jewelry. And when I'm talking crystals, you know, we, we, it's, it's minerals, actual minerals from all over the world. Um, Brazil and Africa, the Middle East. We also have meteorites and tektites and we sell books and candles and art. And like I said in the first episode, it's a funky place, but, um, we get, we get people every day that come in that are either repeat customers or we get new people. And, um, it it's it's a great experience so you know i'll i'll be keeping you guys up to date as we go about what that's like and maybe some of the hardships and uh and how you get through those hardships and um things that i learn as i go we'll have maybe a, a full episode dedicated to just talking about how i started it because the business is under an llc you know maybe you don't know how to start an llc and then we file as an s corp and we have employees so that's a whole other thing but it's it's a, an amazing learning experience, and it's the culmination of all the jobs that I've had in the past, even even washing dishes. Each each one of those jobs has te- has taught me something that has led to uh, running a successful business. So that'll be a future episode too. But uh, let, let's get into it. So again, my guest today was Mimi Page, and um, it, it was just a really nice interview, and. Uh, I hope she enjoyed being on the show. I'm sure that she will uh, join us back again, and we've even talked about maybe her hosting a couple of her own episodes and interviewing some of the people that are in her line of work that uh, that influence her and inspire her. So I hope you guys enjoy it. I will touch base uh, after the interview, give you a nice little outro. Enjoy. All right, so we have our first guest of all time, and I thought it was going to be appropriate to have the first guest be none other than my wife, Mimi Page. She's she's sitting there smiling. <laughs> she's a little shy, but we're going to work through it. Um, but it's not just that she's my wife. We wanted to have her on today because she's also got a very uh, good professional career. She's done a lot to get what she's got and um she's got fans all over the world she's a musician composer songwriter vocalist uh her credits 
include two solo albums. She's done three EPs, multiple singles. She's got over 50 collabs, scored video games, some film, TV placements. She's done speaking engagements. She's run the gamut. She is a big deal. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> so we're welcoming our first guest, Mimi Page. Welcome, Mimi Page. Hi, thank you for having me. Of course. She <laughs> came a long way to be able to do this. So we are, of course, in the back of the Dreaming Peddler. This is a store that we both run together. She does it on a little part-time basis, but she's got a lot of friends and fans in the store too. So um, we're going to jump right in. So first, I kind of wanted to share a little bit about how we met and give a little context here uh, of why she's an appropriate uh, guest for the program, especially first guest. So we met uh, in Los Angeles, which was both of our stomping grounds. She's also a native of old LA. She was on the beach side and I was on the, the Valley Hollywood side, but we had met in Hollywood at a little party. I think I mentioned in the first podcast, I talked about that party. There were salmon burgers on the ground, and uh, both of us had gotten dragged. So I was there with a uh, little band that I was trying to work with, and she had gotten dragged out by an old roommate, right? It was, it was an old roommate. Yeah. Yeah. And so we, we met, and the first thing we said, we turned to each other, and we said, I know you from somewhere. Where do I know you from? We had never met, maybe in a past life, I don't know, but asked her out the first night. We went out. And the only reason that you went out with me was because I said it was my birthday <laughs> and you made me show my ID. <laughs> so, uh, you know, we, we basically have dated and been together since the first night we met. But, uh, you know, when I met her, she was scoring uh, some some. <laughs> oh, God. She was scoring some uh, advanced erotic art. That's what we'll call it. It was yeah. erotic art. Yeah. And she was announcing this to the to the group that, that was sitting around this little bonfire of salmon burgers across from the Viper Room. And uh and I turned to her and I said, No, you don't. You don't you don't score erotic art. She said, Yeah, I do. But uh back then she was just getting the career off the ground and she was working on her first solo record. She was doing live shows around Hollywood, which is you know, a nightmare for anyone that knows that racket. But her shows were good. And she was a driven young lady when I met her. Lived in Koreatown and uh, existed off of oatmeal and uh, cat food. I mean, tuna fish. <laughs> and coffee. And coffee. And uh, she was one of the most driven people I'd ever met. So, you know, when I when I first met her, too, she didn't have any representation. She didn't have anyone to help uh with contracts and you know and i was i was uh trying to do that that was what i was looking to do so we agreed um that i would help with one of her first live shows of uh, one of her big first live um appearances that she was going to do she needed someone to represent her so i i was against it and i was like no she said i really need the help i said okay fine i'll help you out i did that one for her acted as her manager and then it kind of just snowballed from there and so like a lot of other um, famous people out there that have some sort of family member working for them or managing them, it's kind of just worked out that I've managed her career uh, for the last, what, 10 plus years? Mm. 10 plus, I think. Yeah. But it's been nice. So that's that's our relationship. Um, and uh, we're going to get into the official interview here. <laughs> Are you ready, Mimi Page? Yep. <laughs> so I want to know, how did you first get into it? What 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 was the dream that made you want to first get into music? It's a complex question because I was thrust into the world of the performing arts through my family. Every single one of my family members is a musician. And whether it was Broadway or jazz or opera, I just was thrust into this world. But I always heard music differently. Music to me was emotional and very healing. And so my dream really was to heal myself and 
as we know, being LA natives, especially in like high school, it's it can be an intense experience. So I never thought I was a singer. I thought singing was reserved for opera singers and Broadway singers and pop singers. And the first time I heard my voice when I recorded it and put reverb on it, it was it was something that didn't sound like me. It sounded beautiful. And I felt like I heard my soul. And so that drove me that if I could make myself feel really good and peaceful, I can make other people feel that way too. And so, you know, and you didn't have a very typical high school experience either. You you did about two years in a, in a regular and, you know, as regular as it can be with these uh, these beachside high schools. But you transferred over to something a little more specific, right? Yeah, I did. Yeah, I had a really rough two years at a regular high school and just couldn't make it work. I was ditching school so much that I just I wasn't relating to what I was being taught. And so I had a mentor. He was he's my godfather. He's a, an incredible songwriter. He was like, you have talent. I think you would save your schooling experience if you went to a performing arts school. So I went and I auditioned for piano and I just happened to walk by this room full of computers and I walked in and I was like, what is this? And the teacher ended up changing my life. He's like, this is electronic music. This is music technology. I teach you how to record yourself or record other people. And I was like, I need to take this. I didn't even know what it was. <laughs> so you got you got a formal education in high school and and as soon as you got out. Did, is, did you start setting up your, your rig from there? Yeah. Well, I got, it was MySpace that did it for me. It was like, I had my setup at school. And because I started getting a following on MySpace in senior year of high school, I was like, oh my gosh, I have to rebuild what I have here. So uh, as soon as I got what, my own, what was the, what was the track? Was it one track or was it a couple tracks? It was a started? couple, it was a couple tracks that I don't even have out anymore I, they disappeared i don't you, even are you remember. sure we can't find those <laughs> oh my god you i don't it, even think that i've you don't even I, I'm, I'm gonna surprise you yeah i've got them right here are you serious no i, no, I don't no you don't <laughs> i don't think i've ever heard them <laughs> yeah you have not heard them um yeah i don't think so but um yeah, it was just, it was weird. I had a couple of people in the UK, I mean, different countries listen to me and they had no idea I was just this kid in high school. So anyway, I just, I saved up all my money from all my odd jobs. And the the second I got to an apartment, um, I was 18, I got my computer, I got my MIDI keyboard, I got my audio interface, I got Logic Pro and my microphone. And that has been my rig for my whole career. <laughs> Now, I'm guessing, and I think a part of me knows, but did you put all of this on a credit card? Oh, God. Of course I did. All right. Well, actually, not all of it. Not all of it. You, I, had, you had some money, and then you put some on credit. So anything was... that rent, like anything that I made went to rent, and if I had anything extra, then I would put towards musical equipment as when you met me I had what like a mattress on the floor and like no furniture you had a nice computer I had a great computer and I had a beautiful I, what was my Nord or I had a Korg at the time but like I had great equipment and nothing else in my life not even food <laughs> and when when so you were doing that since high school when did you get your first job my first music job? No, your first job job that was that was helping to pay the rent. I was in high school. My first job was Jamba Juice, and I was 16. I was 15 and a half, and I remember I lied to Wells Fargo to get a bank account because I was too young because I knew I wanted to save whatever I was making. So I started a savings account when I was, I think, 15 and a half or 16, and um, then I got a job at a coffee shop, and then... Uh, I got fired from the coffee shop because I didn't know how to make steamed milk and exploded in my face and in somebody else's face. <laughs> and so um, I then went and I found a record store right by my house. And I was the only girl that has ever worked there. And I was 16. And I begged the people. I was like, please, I know everything about 
like film scores, like just hire me. So they hired me. And then that was my job until I graduated. What was that record store? Record surplus. And do they have any of your albums there now? Yeah. So when my first album came out, uh, I went and I gave them hard copies and they didn't believe it. They're like, you did it, maybe. I was like, thanks. Yeah. Probably all sold out by now. Yeah, probably. I think they're all sold out. Probably. But um, so that that was your first setup. That's how you got your rig going. How did you how did you start the business side? So you're you're in your apartment. You got your setup. You're making music. Where did you start getting it out there? How did how did the business side start? So I did a lot of research. I went to briefly a music conservatory. I was Musicians Institute in Hollywood, and I took a mu music business course. And I also had a mentor. It was my my godfather, who is a songwriter, and he told me about BMI and ASCAP. And he was with BMI, and he's like, "If you're a songwriter, you will make the majority of your income off of your songwriting royalties." And he was an angel, and he helped me uh, set up with BMI. I started my own publishing company. What was I? I was 19 or 20. Um, but this was before I even had like any radio play or anything. And so I got that business side down thanks to my godfather. And then um, regarding like CD Baby, which is where I was self-releasing all my stuff, that was just research of like what is the best like record label <laughs> Like where you can have your own record label and not have a label take from you. And so research, you're just talking about Googling it, huh? Googling, YouTube. I think uh, my my high school teacher, Mr. Bruning, had recommended CD Baby. Um, and this is before um, really any social media. This is before um, Facebook and, uh, of course, TikTok and Bandcamp. Just MySpace, huh? I just only had MySpace. And this was right when MySpace Records was coming out. So, like, MySpace went and took that turn. I was like, well, maybe I should sign um, with MySpace Records, you know. But I, something in me was like, just do it yourself. Like, release it yourself. You get 100% of your mechanicals. You get um, your publishing. You you know, if you do it all yourself, and unless a bigger label was worth it. So, uh, who, who are your early influences? Who, what what were the musicians that made you want to pursue it? Because obviously you found your own sound and you wanted to make music because of yourself. But, you know, there, there's got to be some influence that made you want to get out there and play live shows and actually release albums. I never wanted to play live shows ever. I had briefly a really very, I don't want to call him evil, but he was a terrible person trying to manage me. And you know, the only good thing that came from that was that he forced me to play live. I had such severe stage fright, so I'm grateful to him for that. I just wanted to be in my apartment releasing music. What I was were, already, What were some of the first places he played live? Uh, room 5. I don't even know if that still exists. It was on La Brea. Um, it was above an Italian restaurant. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and it was just... It's kind of a prerequisite for bands is playing restaurants a, an italian restaurant or above an italian restaurant yeah and then i played a pizza parlor yeah, second, on hollywood second Boulevard. you were checking them off right now yeah. yeah like tons of bars in hollywood um which was hard for me because my sound was very ethereal and you've got a bunch of bars like there's people talking getting drunk and i'm like i just hated it i i was like people don't they're, they can't hear me in this setting. Um, so that performing live was really, really tough for me when I started out. And um, just recording for me, though, was like I, I'm made for headphones. And so I was watching, even though people, when I was starting out, um, the shows were really hard. I was getting more and more traction on internet radio and um, seeing my recordings uh, fly and flourish uh, in different countries so i'm like this is weird you know because i was always told like you got to do live shows and i'm like but i'm doing okay like just recording so it was a weird contradiction there so, so to circle back who who were your influences who, who did you really look up to uh so the first record i ever got that really got me in touch with my sound was pure moods that was the compilation i was seven years old and my mom is a broadway performer so i was just always on tour with her growing up listening to loud energetic stuff but it was an infomercial for pure moods and it was deep forest enigma enya all these really ethereal um 
cinematic artist I'd never heard before. And I was like, I t- I looked at her. I'm like, you need to get me this, please. She's like, okay. And so she, God bless her, got me that record. And I was hooked on the sound. And then when I got into high school, I was realizing my natural ability to record and make harmonies and choirs with my voice. I'm like, I kind of sound like all these bands that I really like. And then I discovered Tori Amos, who was just my my hero as just a emotional therapy as an artist uh, on the piano and vocal. And I'm like, you know what? I can sing and play at the same time and really just be acoustic and stripped down on all these different sounds and electronic instruments. And so I got all of her albums in notation and learned every single album of hers. But Tori still recorded in a studio. Did you have did you have any sort of reference um, for what you wanted to do in music? Someone that was at home? No. Because, you know, what you were doing in those early sessions and your early recording and, you know, still to this day in a different way, but that's something that's that's pretty widely practiced mm-hmm. is kind of the self-recording, the home studio thing. But you didn't have anyone to ask any questions or anyone to look up to at that point? No. I graduated high school in 2005 and I had no reference about what I was doing. No home studio reference. The goal at that time was still find a record label who can fund an actual recording studio. And so I just had so much energy moving through me. I'm like, I I can't wait. And I don't have time. Like I got to pay rent. I got to live. So I just out of necessity was recording myself. I didn't know anybody else at the time that was doing that. Um, so I really just, I was in the dark doing it. And then you, you know, you were doing your live shows and you talked about somebody that was kind of pushing in it, doing live shows. And that's about right when we met was when you were, um, just breaking away from that relationship. Mm -hmm. And, um, I know that you were wanting to get out of the world, but you didn't, and you were still doing live shows, even though you didn't want to. And, um, trying to push your music out there. So I guess, you know, I'm going to wrap this question into one very nice question, but how did you manage some of your early disappointments? So, you know, including that instance of kind of losing your first manager, having to do shows you didn't want to do. And I'll give some context for people out there that don't know the LA music scene as it used to be. I don't know if it's still like it or not, but they have a thing called pay to play and um, pay to play you know, is is where they, they take a band and they, they make you pay to to go up on stage. And it'll be at bars. Bars are making money. They're making money at the door. But you got to pay. And, uh, and sometimes they'll take a portion of your merch to <laughs> make you kiss the ring. But I don't think that you did any pay to play necessarily. You might have done a couple shows pay to play. But um, how did you manage some of those early disappointments before you started to get some successes? How did how did you keep going through early disappointments? Oh, man, just my ego was just bashed and bruised all the time. I mean, you've got rejection when people don't show up to watch you. You've got rejection when you send your demos out to people like record labels or radio stations. And so what really got me through all of that was tunnel vision and spirituality. I. I had a love for what I was creating. I you, and you know me, my music to me is like my child. I love it 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 doesn't come from me. It comes from something higher than me and it's it's a sacred energy to me. Yeah, so, I know you, you you have something unique when it comes to your artistry that, you know, there's so many actors out there that'll never watch. Um you know, any of their roles. You have musicians that will do things and have some self-loathing. But ever since I've known you, you have always put out these, put out these things, you've made it something external, and then you really do love it. So it's like all of, you know, all your children put out there and and you love all them equally. Yeah. And that's always been, I think that that's something fairly unique with artists is to also love your art, to be open about loving your art. Without without ego. It's not an egotistical thing. It's a very genuine love. 
And I think, you know, I don't love every single thing I've created because I've learned and evolved in my craft. So early on stuff, I'll hear my vocals or I'll hear a, a chord progression and I'm like, okay, we've we've evolved past that. But there are certain times as an artist when, you know, in my sacred days of having a mattress on the floor and tuna fish and coffee because I couldn't afford anything else because rent was so expensive and I would sit and write something from my soul and it was so, so meaningful and it was so beautiful and I felt like whatever God is was working through me and it didn't matter what I looked like. It didn't matter what I had. It was something sacred and not of this earth that would move through me. And so through all that rejection, that got me through it all. It was my love. It was it was my my ability to create in general. And so, you know, what I, what I wanted to uh, tie in there is the theme of the podcast, which is pursuing the dream. So that was that was your way of pursuing the dream is is really that you couldn't let go of the dream. You could not uh, get away from it if you tried. Yeah, which I, is good. You can't. You can't. <laughs> so now that we got the 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 dirty question out of the way, let, let's get to the the fun question. How about let's talk about the first successes. Let's talk about the first things that elevated you. And one thing I've always kind of talked about um, when it comes to uh, kind of a professional lifestyle and, you know, whether it's in entertainment or it's anything is you have these levels that you can pass. And on each one of these levels is a certain number of people. So millions and millions of people out there have a dream. Then, then some of them act on it. Now you're in a whole different pool. You've, you've stepped up and now you're in a pool with maybe just a couple million people that have actually tried it. Then you go out and you do live shows. Now you're in a smaller pool. But you, you, you had your first success with a couple placements of your original stuff. Mm-hmm. And now you're in a smaller pool. So, so talk to me. What, what were those first successes that, that got you into a, a smaller pool of people? The, the coolest memory I have, they're two really magical memories because I was so young and broke at the time. And all I did was have my dream was I worked at a grocery delivery company, <laughs> yummy.com. And I it was the only way I could write music in the morning because I'm a morning person. I cannot write at night. I, I fade at night. So I just would write and write and write and then mail my demos to multiple stations and things like that. And so we had a demo out um, to Sirius XM and it was the chill station. And I remember just playing chill in my yummy car and I would do deliveries at night. And I, it was just some people, you really get a taste of humanity when you're delivering food to people or you're in the service industry and you're carrying lugs, jugs of water up flights of stairs and your hands are hurting and they don't tip you and maybe some people are really scary. And, <laughs> you know, so it was, it was a really hard job. And one night my song came on the radio on Sirius XM, Chill. And I remember pulling over and sobbing hysterically. And I was like, I'll get emotional just thinking about it. But I was just like, I'm going to get out of here. I'm going to get out of here. And that was like manifestation. I'm like, this is my dream. And I used to tell everybody in that shop who made fun of me um, because I used to run back and forth trying to get as many deliveries as possible. And they would just laugh at me. And I was like, oh, I got on the radio today. you know. And it was so great. Um, That moment. That was my dream. That was my first real success of hearing myself on the radio in my yummy car. And then um, I had my first major placement on The Real World. And it was my song, This Fire. Do you remember what season that was? Uh, It was Vegas. I think it was The the Real World, Las Vegas. I don't know what season. That was a good season. <laughs> Did you enjoy that? <laughs> I, I enjoyed every season of Real World when that was a thing. Really, I loved Real World, the Road Rules, all that. So, oh. I could I could see your your music uh, highlighting a, a Real World episode. Well, the irony is that I it was during like a a love scene. It was like this like big well, moment. 
<laughs> and, you know, you met me. <laughs> what else? And, and just to backtrack that erotic art job, um, I was trying to score film. That's what I have always set out to do. My music is very cinematic. And so the only the first offer was, hey, do you want to score this website? You know, and like the, the money was OK. It would pay my rent. And I was like, yeah, I'll, I'll score it. Sure. So it was so ironic that like the big moment on the show, which was mainstream on MTV, was this like love scene and this big thing. And my whole song played. And when you're an artist and you have placements, you have background music or you've got featured vocals. And so it was my full song with my vocals. And it was um, like the whole duration of the song. So it was a big deal to me. And I had no idea what that would do in the moment. I started getting all these notifications. I still worked at Yummy, I think. (laughs) And um, I was like charting what number 11 on iTunes. I was like, what? Like, and I owned the song. I wasn't on a label. And so I was like, what's going on? I'm on my own record label, self-releasing this. I produced the song. I engineered it. I performed it. Like, this is this is insane. And then I got like a notification from Sound Exchange a couple months later because, you know, 99 cents when people download or stream your song is not that much. But then I didn't know about Sound Exchange. And as a performer, you don't just have mechanical royalties you make from a song sale. You also have your performance royalties. And I didn't even know what Sound Exchange was. So they contacted me and they're like, oh, you've got all these uh, performances that we have to pay you for. And it was all back pay. And I'm like, okay. And it was like thousands of dollars. And I was like, what? And I remember almost passing out and I was like, I'm making money from my music. Like what? So that, (laughs) that was like an amazing moment. So it was probably around that time too, that you started to do some collaborations. And, you know, and as I mentioned at the beginning, that's been a big part of your career. You've had over 50 collabs. A lot of it's in EDM. Um, you've had some some pretty big hits with some big people. You've done um, some some lower end things with people that are a little more unknown because primarily you you like the music. So you'll 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 do work if you like the music and you like the person. That's yeah, absolutely. Number one thing for me, just working my way up in music. It's always been about the soul of the song, and I resonate with the soul of an artist and if I love the music I don't care you know how many likes or whatever the currency is I honor the spirit of the other human being and so I love collaborating when something really inspires me and then that allows me to grow as an artist as well because I've always wanted to be in a band and that never worked out I was always just a solo artist um you had had some time with a band for a bit and that's right did a little tour of the East Coast with with some good friends that were in your band, and yeah. you played some good shows. That was fun. That was fun. That was my band, though. You yeah. know, I mean, like, just writing with other people is a really beautiful process, and I've always been the main writer for all my stuff, so collaborating with people has always been my way to, like, kind of be in a band in a way. So in the middle of doing those collaborations, you also had your second album, so the whole... The whole first part of our talk and you getting those first placements, that was on her album called Breathe Me In. And uh, this whole time, though, you had another another bag full of songs and you put those together and you made an album called Ethereal Blues. And that was your last solo album. Um, tell me tell me about tell me about putting out a second album, and what that was like. The process of putting out a second album So just as on the business side, my first album, you know, I had originally set out to just self-release my music, but I got a record deal for my first record, which did not go how I wanted it to go at all. I didn't feel respected. I didn't have the type of uh, collaboration that was... Which I think is another prerequisite sometimes for bands and musicians is, is a lot of them out there will have a have a crappy first record or crappy first deal. And that broke me because, but it was good in a way because I needed to learn and I'm still learning and tapping in that my core gift is my own inner power and what I can do 
for myself. And when I realized I was pushing my first record harder than that record label was, but they owned me for like how many years I was broken about that. And they didn't follow up with a promise of extending my tour or anything. So I crash landed into a very deep depression, um, which took, you know, a lot of rebuilding of who I was as an artist. And so going back to the piano, when you feel like a failure, um, is painful. It's like you're, you're busted up. And I just remember my first song off that record was the way and the way was being so lost again, like just not knowing what's ahead for you. And when you have already invested in a portion of your career and you're Getting older, I mean, how I was 25. So, but to me, in in LA terms, as you know, age is like a ticking time bomb, at least for the old world we grew up in. So I'm like, oh my God, I'm aging. I'm too old for this. I'm, it was just, I was in a really dark space. And I sat and I remember just playing an F sharp. And I was just like, I was like, nothing's gonna come for me anymore. I cannot write anymore. I am lost. I suck. And all of a sudden, it started turning into a pattern. And then all of a sudden the chord progression came and all of a sudden I started crying and all these words started coming from my soul. And the, the, what were the lyrics? I hear you're the one who knows. So tell me where my spirit goes. If I'm more than skin and bones, please tell me where my spirit goes. And I, and that whole chorus was about me finding my spirituality again, which is what I always had when I had nothing. I had the mattress on the floor in, in Koreatown, and I was in a scary part of town. <laughs> and I was like, Mimi, you lost your way. You lost your way. And so I named it The Way, and it was me getting back in tune with my spirit and my soul and my love no matter what. And I'm like, success is inside. It's not this external thing. And so the whole album evolved from that, and it became this beautiful like redemption of me coming home to myself. And I remember painting my walls in my studio, this ethereal blue color. It was like this shimmer. And I'm like, what are the, what is the ethereal blues? You know, my, my sound has always been ethereal and that means otherworldly, but the blues, it's not just a color, but it's a genre of sadness. And so I really summed up my my art is like I sing about sadness from an otherworldly beautiful perspective and that's what the whole album was shaping is like you can you can move through grief and sadness and failure and have this beautiful transformation through that. Well, I've always I've always kind of thought of it as a concept album and and it's you know definitely probably your your best piece a completed piece and it, you know for for all you guys listening on Spotify or Apple, you can check out the Ethereal Blues. That's our second full length album. The uh, cover, we got a, a local artist in LA and uh, had her paint the uh, the picture on there. I love it. Mm. And I'm, I'll give myself a shout out. I took the photo of her first album. You did, yes. Shot. It was just a little impromptu thing. So you had, uh, you had your two albums out. You had you had collaborations that you were that you were doing and um you know you had you you wrote all of your own music so while you were out there you were also wanting to compose for film tv and or video games preferably all three um we we reached out together cuz again i was i was quasi managing your career i was i was your de facto manager as we like to say um but we reached out and we got a great person um, to connect with us and uh, believe he's since retired. But we, we talked to a pretty famous uh, video game agent and anyone that was in the, the industry that I talked to was was amazed that I talked to. I guess I guess I had called him at the end of his career and actually got him to pick up the phone. And we had a great conversation. But. Through that, he connected us with someone that was going to be an awesome part of your uh, collaborative career going forward. But that was Enon Zor, who's the mm-hmm. um, composer, of course, of the Fallout series and uh, Serbia series and many other amazing things. But uh, tell us about the the switch over to doing professional vocals. 
Yeah. I mean, I never thought I was a singer. So it it was like m- what I thought was my weakness was my gift. Because you were always manipulating your voice in, in yeah. studio and p- having control over it. Yeah. And so it was amazing going up um, because all my collaborations mostly are through Skype or email because everyone's across the country. Um, So it was amazing. I remember my first session with Enon, like I just went up and he's like, all right, let's go record. And I heard the song for the first time. I didn't get to like, you know, like sit with it. And he's like, all right, let's record. And I didn't have like all my crazy reverbs and like I could hide. And I was like, oh, my God, this is going to up my game. And he has been such an incredible mentor for me as a performer and as a recording artist, you know, and his music has always been so prolific, the orchestrations. And so just what I've done, you know, my articulations and things like that with my instrument has been amazing. Um, Yeah. Super, super, super epic collaboration with him. And then we kind of parlayed once we were, you know, we had a we had a toe in that industry, found some amazing other indie games that you were able to to actually compose full scores for, and that also led to some uh, some scoring work with Zach Bagans, who is from Ghost Adventures, mm-hmm. and. You had uh, scored a couple episodes as well as his full length movie, which was called The Demon House. So what was it like to take on a project like that where you would have so much material and basically to sit in your room and have to figure out what the sounds were compared to visuals that weren't yours? Well, it was like in the realm of one of my favorite topics, which is like ghosts. So I was like, this is so fun. And I just loved his show. Um, And I just really, you know, above loving the environment and what the project was, I tapped into the greater essence of what I felt he stood for. And that was um, what I what I love. It's spirituality and exploring the unknown, the unseen. And that whole score was really, it was dark. And I got to explore sonically what darkness sounds like in a very safe way. And it's you know, it was it was really cool, like exploring with like static and um, sound design and then using my vocals in a very like ghost like way. Um, it was it was fun. And then there were some scenes, though. I'm not going to lie. I was really scared and my computer shut off at one point And I'm like, you know, tripping out because it's dark and I'm on a deadline. I'm like, did the power go out or is this like interference? You know, so it's just it was it was a really fun experience scoring that film. So so if you could only do one or the other going forward, which is either either songwriting, you know, where you're talking your typical songs, three to five minute songs, a beginning and end or composing, composing big, long, beautiful scores to other people's work. Which one do you think you would want to do going forward? And then maybe what which one is easier? Well, you know, it's interesting. Before my first EP, I scored a film. I scored a short film, and then um, I was scoring Tyranny, that uh, web series. And and scoring has always come more naturally to me. Um, and I always incorporate my vocals into everything that I do. So in a way, just me scoring feels very, like, I don't know, easier for me. Um, writing music like songs, there's so much that goes into like calculating um, just structures, hooks, um, bringing in concepts lyrically. It's it's very intense. And there's an art to it, though, because uh, what was so cool, <laughs> as we know, we just had a child. Um, I wrote a lot of the... Did deli- we? Yes, we did. <laughs> oh, my God. Can you believe that? Um, But I got to write a lot of the Delirium album signs. Uh, I have what? How many songs do I have on that? Three Three. or three? Um, Pregnant. And I was so exhausted 
at that stage, it was post COVID. I just took a break from like writing a ton and I was super tired. But then, you know, I got the opportunity to like write for like this awesome band that I've collaborated with before. And I actually listened to them in high school and the project just felt so good. And writing something really ethereal and emotional while I felt like I couldn't do it (laughs) was so inspiring. I'm like, it just, it taught me like inspiration will always kick in whenever the opportunity is there. And so I could not pick which one I like more. I love writing music. I love writing songs. I love scoring. They're both just different art forms in in different ways. So, you know, as you mentioned, we'd had a kid. So you obviously took a, a big step back. Most people that end up having a kid, whether you're in the corporate world or obviously in the entertainment world, you gotta, you gotta take a step back and, you know, um, females in particular will need to take a step back and really concentrate on the kid for a portion of time. So in stepping back though, one thing that you did pick up and kind of run with was a focus on, on sound healing and, uh, mu- music, uh, like meditation music. So tell us, tell us about some of the stuff that you were developing and maybe, maybe about the app that you were uh, working with. Yeah. So the sound healing stuff, um, I, it really started out when we were in the thick of LA and I couldn't listen to music anymore. You know, I went through a huge period where I, I couldn't listen to music and it was very annoying to be around me. I could only listen to rain and water sounds and like meditative sounds, solfeggio frequencies. And that was very healing for me to like heal my my mind and my physical body. And so when we moved to Texas, which was a new location, um, I'm finally in nature, which I've always just dreamed of being in. But then right like after we moved, COVID hit and we're in lockdown. I was like, oh, my God, like all of a sudden, like all these ambient sounds just started like coming into my mind. There was no lyrics. There's nothing. And I'm like, I've got an album in here. And so I just started doing these live uh, improvisations on Instagram live for my followers and all these beautiful sounds um, that were very hypnotic and and meditative. And then um, I started uploading them on Insight Timer, which is an amazing meditation app where it it tracks how many hours you're meditating. So if you have trouble just sitting down um, and you're just like, I just need two minutes or I need five minutes just to like regulate your system. I love this app because it tracks that for you. It saves the different people that work. Sometimes you want, you know, just solfeggio frequencies or sound healing bowls or nature sounds or guided meditation. So this app was so cool. I uploaded all my stuff on there. And then uh, I got a whole beautiful set of crystal healing bowls. I'm like, I got to do this live because some of my sound healing is is with virtual instruments, flutes, harps, all that. But the live with the bowls and the gong and all these rhythms and vibrations. And I, you know, I love crystals. We got a crystal shop. It was like harmonizing quartz quartz is such a powerful crystal. I mean, it's in our computers. It's in our watches. It actually holds vibration and energy. And so when you harmonize this instrument, you're literally affecting your physical body. And so when I was doing this for myself, I was like, oh my God, I feel amazing. And so then I started doing it in our our room that we built at the peddler. And then I started doing live sound healings at an uh, incredible yoga studio called the yellow, yellow, bleh, yellow butterfly. And, um, I was just like, this is, this is really, really cool. I love this new way to express music because it's not so much an agenda of giving you a song. It's not an agenda of scoring, visual media. This is taking somebody inside of themselves and able to give them back to themselves. That's what sound healing really is. So so can we maybe expect some of this music maybe on our new album? Any new album that's coming out? Uh, Any new project that's coming out? I got I got a lot of stuff unreleased. I've got um I do I'm gonna do a sound healing album of just really healing vibrations and then I got a whole other songwriting album that I've been sitting on for like four years so any timeline nope 
Nope. Nope. Not at all. So you, you've, you've kind of shown us that you have had a, a long career, you know, 99% of that was completely self-started. Um, you have, you know, the, the tagline of this podcast trials by fire. I think that your, your, your early trial by fire, you know, you mentioned when you got that call from, from the companies that owed you money for your performance, you had no idea that there was even something like this out there Mm -hmm. that you were having to jump in very quickly because success was kind of meeting you halfway. Mm -hmm. Um, so you've learned a lot through your music, your music career through a trial by fire. Now, what, what type of advice would you give to somebody? Cause you know, we probably don't have too many people listening that are specifically trying to be musicians. There's, maybe there are some, but there's probably more people that are looking to start their own business to be an entrepreneur. Now, what advice would you give on the business side about, uh, how to, how to get started? <sighs> I'm going to approach this like an like an artist and just say, what is your voice? Um, embrace your weirdness. Embrace your unique voice. It doesn't matter what medium you have. Um, this is, you know, we're we're kind of like in the realm of a playground when you're an entrepreneur. You're building something. You're creating it from the ground up. So you know, don't copy other people, learn from them, research like heck and 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 learn how you can inject your light, your energy, your creative vision into the world that you want to enter into. And that's your magic. That's your spirit. So go with who you are, but keep evolving. Don't settle. You're always going to grow. You're always going to change. You know, for me as an artist, I had no idea where I was going to go. I and quite honestly, you know, what was this in high school? It was, you know, turn of the century 2000 to 2004. Everyone was telling me around me, like, have a backup plan. Um, You know, music is really rough. There's piracy. You know, at the time, Napster was big. There wasn't TikTok. You couldn't go viral overnight. Cell phones were still really clunky. People still had pagers. You know, like it was a different world that I was in. But my creative vision was so strong in that I loved what I did. I believed in myself. I could not see the road ahead. So I knew to some degree I was going to trailblaze it. So any entrepreneur out there, whatever your field is, go with your love. When you tap into what you love, your passion, that will see you through. That's the light in the darkness. So what do you, what do you see as the next step or the next big thing for your career? You know, you mentioned that you do have the new uh, Delirium album out. That's your latest collaboration. You have an album on the future. But what, where would you like to see your career go? in the next phase it's gonna sound boring but like i want a balanced life the first half that's all we can hope for right that's the the first half of my life was struggling and hustling to get to this invisible place now there were launching like landing pads you know to be financially independent um to be self-sufficient to have more food in my cabinet, you know, <laughs> not just have a mattress on the floor, but live in a safe place and, you know, where I wasn't scared walking home. Um, you know, certain things just those were like my hopes financially and, you know, location wise. But for the career side and the success portion, um, the balanced life was something I needed to really learn Unless I'm a happy human being outside of my art, my art means nothing. You know, I want to have love in my life. You know, I'm incredibly grateful for you. You're my best friend. And, you know, I feel like we are constantly learning about each other and deepening what it's like to be a human being because we're able to live life together. That's sacred. So having a strong relationship. Um rooted in friendship and then learning about myself being well balanced, uh, you know, with my diet, my mental health, um, being able to to be at peace in this world because it's very chaotic at times outside. Um, and then 
you know, the music and my career, all of that, whatever inspires me, I want to do. So I don't have a vision of like, this is what I'm going to become. I'm going to achieve this. I'm going to win this award. I don't really care about that stuff. I care about the next project that comes to me. I want to show up with my all and give it my soul and have a beautiful time creating it and then have other people enjoy it and receive it in that way. And whatever medium that is, that'll be the medium. But that's really shifted from my really goal oriented. This is going to happen. It better happen this time, all this stuff. And it, it, I just want to be happy and at peace with whatever I'm doing. So have 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 you, you know, thinking back on, on the whole career, do you think that you've achieved the dream that you set out to do? Or have you seen that dream change maybe a little bit? I think every day is a dream. I, I if you, if I had had that question asked to me early on, I would have told you it's going to look like this. It's going to have this. It's going to be all these physical things. But what I am sitting in with the knowledge today and the wisdom is that I am living the dream every day I wake up, that I'm alive, that I'm able to create it all, and that I have love in my life. Um, I have love for my craft. Um, I have love in my my personal life. Um, I've got air in my lungs. That is my dream. It's it's of being alive and at peace. That's a very grounded uh, outlook there. Well, I really appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you for stopping in today. <laughs> You're quite <laughs> welcome. <laughs> and I'm sure that we'll uh, talk with you again at some point. And we've even talked about maybe Mimi could uh, do a couple hosting gigs of her own in some of the future episodes. So. <laughs> Not the last that we've seen or heard from you. Awesome. But again, check out Mimi's music on Spotify. You can look her up on YouTube, Apple Music, SoundCloud, lots of different platforms. Best thing to do is just to go to Google, type in Mimi Page, P-A-G-E, like paper. <laughs> Thanks, Mimi. Thank you. Well, that was just great. Appreciate uh, Mimi stopping by, of course. Hope you guys enjoyed that. Uh, I thought it was nice. I thought it was a really good first interview, and I hope that there was some uh, good use out of it. She was happy. That was cool. I'm glad that she was happy. She said that it was uh, it was like, you know, like like she didn't know me that I was uh, a stranger interviewing her. I guess that was, I guess that was fun. I tried to just be impartial. I mean, I was uh, interested every every question she had. Fascinating girl. Always has been. So uh, you can find us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts. We're going to start getting the YouTube uploaded. Um, Mimi also is going to be managing the Instagram and the Facebook. You can find us there at Pursuing the Dream Podcast. Spotify and Apple, it's going to be just pursuing the dream. I'm sure that you could tag the podcast on there and they're not going to hate you for it. I've got an upcoming episode that I'm looking forward to next week. Uh, starting to get in the flow of this, of looking and, and thinking about those future episodes. It's, it's fun. I really enjoy this. Hope you're enjoying it. But uh, next week's episode, it's going to be titled, uh, But Did You Die? Dot, 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 question mark. But did you die? That's a question. Um uh, was driving behind a car the other day, young lady driving it, and no bumper stickers, nothing. She had a sticker on the back of her windshield, and it said, but did you die? And man, did that stick with me. <laughs> I think I've been thinking about it every day. What a great question. Applies to a lot. So we're going to be talking about that, and I think, you know, the slug line there is, uh, but did you die, rites of passage, and embracing the suck. Embracing the suck. So you can tune in next week to uh, to hear my show about that, but did you die. So, uh, final thoughts. I think that Mimi is, is a great example of uh, self-starting and getting your business, sticking with it, you know, the old, the old saying that that businesses, uh, you know, I, I don't remember off the top of my head, but how 
on how their overnight success is after a thousand hours. You know, I'm paraphrasing, but she's definitely put in her thousand hours. She's definitely an expert in her field. And uh, you know, one thing we didn't even talk about too is she has produced um, other artists. She's she's brought them in and recorded them and then produced it, passed it back. So she's got a very big catalog, big library. Make sure you guys check that out. Uh, send me an email. Info at pursuingthedreampodcast.com. Info at pursuingthedreampodcast.com. You shoot me an email, ask a question, ask a question of Mimi, ask a question of a future guest. We'll do our best to answer that. Any thoughts on the shows? You want to tell me to go, uh, go, you know, F off into the hills and tell me that too. That's fine. I'll take it. But I appreciate you joining us today. Hope you guys have a wonderful week. Looking forward to seeing you guys by the fireside next week. And uh, I'll close with that same comment that I made last week, you know. What if everything you're going through right now is just getting you to a dream that you couldn't have imagined? Everything has happened for a reason. Isn't that a great thought? Isn't that good? Until next time, this is Jason Robbins for Mimi Page. Pursuing the Dream Podcast. Have a great week. Guys.